can tell we prepped a lot. So, we're going to talk about appreciation, and we won't be too critical. We're going to be mostly appreciative. And I'm going to kick this off with a question for our friend from Christie's. And this relates to the initial decision of the major auction houses to get into the NFT space, which even the word NFT, I'm not even sure what that even means anymore. But let's say the digital art space. Let's get away from tokenology and all that talk. And what prompted Christie's to get into this space, as well as Sotheby's and Phillips? And what are you thinking now? What's your longevity in the space? And why are you in it at all? So I think, um, you know, everybody knows about sort of the people moment. And everybody thinks that that was you know, we just sort of plunged into this this world at that moment. But the reality is that Christie's was very committed to art and tech and had sort of been on an art and tech journey for quite a while. Um, we were the first auction house to sell an AI-generated work at auction was, um, from the collective called Obvious out of Paris. We were the first auction house to sell mixed reality work. It was work by Marina Abramovich. Uh, we were the first auction house to uh, record a sale on blockchain. We've been doing a number of these art and tech summits, sort of leading the dialogue around this space for a number of years, all before uh, we got into, you know, all before Beeple happened. I think Beeple was, the Beeple sale was very much sort of a confluence of, of a number of things. I mean, it was definitely, um, you know, there was the COVID happening, COVID happening, and, and we had sort of moved online, as everyone did, with this dramatic pivot, um, not just uh, live streaming our sales, but also the experience of the auctions, the virtual galleries and the virtual talks. Um, we had, um, and, and again, we've been doing these summits, so it was sort of like we were already committed to the online space, so the NFT and online sale was sort of a natural evolution in that sense, but also we recognized that there was this, um, you know, incredible sort of new birth of these crypto millionaires or billionaires because of the, the whole crypto market. So I think that the Beeple decision was definitely a risk that we, I think we went into it with our eyes open, you know, unsure what that was going to look like. It was originally, the work was um, originally, it opened, the auction opened at $100, which gives you a sense of we really had no idea where this was going. We had to pause the auction. Actually, at one point it was an online auction, so it was on for um, about a week or so. We had to pause it at one point when, it, when the bidding hit a um, uh, million dollars because we weren't even prepared from a KYC, know your client standpoint, to take bids above that. So, I mean, we went into it excited and optimistic, but we're truly caught off guard by, you know, by the incredible enthusiasm that um, that developed from that. And I don't want to talk before, but I, I'm happy to share, you know, our view going forward because I do think that changed our mindset in many ways and got us really excited about potential of this space. Okay, and uh, so that's interesting to hear your perspective and that that was really such a surprise. I think that sale was also really um, the, the result of some market mechanics that were in place at that time where uh, Medicoven and the other guy, uh, they had just fractionalized uh, the B20 token. And so this was something that was going to also be fractionalized. And whatever happened to that? I'm not sure that they actually did fractionalize that. I know that that was, that, that was in their plan. Um, and they bought a number of people works. That's, you know, I think he bought some before that. Um, and so he's sort of, you know, was on that people, uh, you know, he's, he's definitely a, a fan for a while, I think. But I, I think that the whole tokenization of artworks is still, everybody's talking, or fractionalization, everybody's talking about it. I mean, a lot of people are exploring it. I don't think anyone's exactly nailed what that's going to look like in terms of um, a secondary market yet. And there are issues around regulation, and I mean, there's, there are a lot of complicating factors there. Um, but I think the market mechanics overall, in terms of crypto, were, were really key there. And so, Seth, I would like to ask you, um, you have now done how many 
shows with bright moments. You're on your fifth or sixth city? Or? Tokyo's our seventh city. Seventh city. So now with Tokyo coming, you are basically, you have created what is an experiment and a very exciting experiment and one that's constantly evolving and will continue to evolve and to change in, in a very interesting way. So my question as someone who's running a traditional gallery and also having shown NFTs, what have you learned so far that you will take forward to Tokyo? So I think um, one of the through lines like from the beginning for us that was kind of an accident, I'll just tell you quickly how Bright Moment started. So we were all in pandemic and quarantine in Venice Beach. Uh, this was the spring of last year, 2021. And um, NFT started to happen on Super Rare. It started to happen again. Some, some new wave happened on Super Rare, on the foundation, NBA Top Shot, people, something was clearly happening. A lot of creative people f stuck in quarantine wanted to come out. Um, decided to open up an NFT gallery and put some screens on the walls and do it as a DAO. Um, and we identified, and this is where luck kind of came in, we identified Jeff Davis as our first artist to show in the gallery. And Jeff, uh, as many of you may know, is a co-founder and chief creative officer of Artbox. So in the process of putting up Jeff's um, pre-minted works called Portals that were generative, um, we realized that no one was going to come to a gallery during the daytime, so why not give away NFTs to people who show up, and only give them if they show up physically. And so that's how Crypto Venetian started, is come to the gallery between 3 and 5 p.m., which is probably a horrible time for most galleries, no one shows up, come and get a free NFT. And not just that, but the NFT was generated on the spot. And so we used an on-chain generative art platform, namely Artblocks, to mint people's NFTs when they came to the gallery. And what we saw and what we felt and what I think we've, we've carried on through all these cities is the experience that people feel when they're minting something physically in real life with each other. It was not obvious at the time, but every city that we've done these shows in Incomplete Control in New York and um, more and more of the experiences on FX Hatch as well recently with Peter Pasma is this feeling of with a long form code based algorithm, there's anywhere from a hundred or a thousand different outputs. The artist hasn't seen them before. The artist has written that the code knows the range of outputs, but there's something very special when the collector and the artist see the art for the first time together. And that's something that really hasn't been possible before. I think it's something during the pandemic with people behind their screens minting multiple NFTs took for granted. It was very transactional. Um, you know, Dave was there in Mexico with us. I think what we really try to do is celebrate this moment of minting and revealing as something that's social and emotional and makes you attach more to the art because you were there when it was given birth. Um, that's the a key learning, I think, that we've taken throughout all these cities. Can I answer your question? Yeah, and so crypto has certainly had its ups and downs since I started looking at it seriously in 17 or 18. What do you feel is a characteristic of your community and their attachment to their mints and their collections? Do you have any sense of how sticky it is and, you know, the diamond hands concept I've heard, but in fact, so many of these mints seem to be, this is going back to what we're talking about, so many of these mints are uh, financially motivated, but many of them, people keep what they uh, have created. So how, how much of the mechanics are involved? There's a saying, it's not about the floor price, it's about the floor price, right? You try to ignore it at the same time. Um, you know, I think what we have with these NFT systems and these and these tokenized marketplaces and roadmaps, and that's whether it's quantum or bright moments or proof or art blocks or any of these platforms or, or, or curated collections, 
is you have an art system and you have an economic system, and they go hand in hand with each other. Um, I think our true north for bright moments has been long form, on chain generative art. Right? We've stayed away from other projects, or we haven't done a ton of PFP projects, or uh, AI work that is, is obviously interesting, or photography. I think our our focus point has been, um, in many cases, you know, taking artists that have done, in the case of Tyler Hobbs with Fidenza, Tyler did a thousand Fidenzas on art blocks, and then we did his next drop, which was a hundred incomplete controls. Um, or Matt DeMaurier, we did Meridians, a thousand of them, and then we did a hundred folios. And so there's obviously a built-in supply-demand dynamic with artists that have already proved themselves. Um, we definitely use that to our advantage. Um, you know, in Mexico, we did Snow Froze. I mean, he did the friendship, friendship bracelets, but it was really his first significant drop since Chromie Squiggles. There's 10,000 squiggles, and there's only um, 100 of the pieces in Mexico. Um, so I think we're mindful of, of, of not oversaturating the market with mints. Um, but at the same time, I think certain, there's some extremely um, impressive, powerful artists right now using code that we will look back on in 20 years and be like, duh, you had a chance to collect an MLG or an Iskra um, or a Tyler Hobbs or a Matt Deloria. Can I just say one thing I think you guys are doing so well from uh, just the outside Please, perspective? Thank you. Yeah. Um, and yes, I, you didn't ask me to say this, obviously. Um, is that everybody talks about the concept of community in this space, and it, I feel like it's a massively overused concept, and, and I think for a lot of people, community means that they have a Discord channel and, and there's, you know, somebody, two people are talking. Um, but I feel like what you're doing so well is it's, you've actually created that community just by nature of how you're structuring this. Like TR Lab is another one. I was talking to them earlier today. And I think that companies that are really, um, are authentic or really exploring what community means in terms of actual engagement, I think that's key to creating value in this space and to creating that stickiness because you're so, you're so, you know, connected. And uh, Rebecca, fill us in on what's going on with Puss Your Eye and, and that whole thing. I remember when the project started, I think the timing has been challenging for you, most probably. Give us a brief little history of how you launched and where you are today. Yeah, definitely. So I was introduced to Nadia, one of the founders of Puss Your Eye, actually at NFT NYC back in, last year 2022 and Justin Aversano, I was working with Quantum at the time, introduced me because he knew that Nadia was looking to bring the ethos of Pussy Riot into Web3 and what does that actually practically look like and especially at the time for those of you that have been around since 2017, 2018, you'll be very well aware that women and queer creators in this space barely existed. At the end of like 2022, I believe the statistic was only 5% of all work that was purchased was actually created by women in this space. So it was a clear need um, for something to change and there to be a larger conversation about how we could support underrepresented groups within Web3 and especially the NFT space. Uh, so we kind of hit the ground running in January. I've had a really big background in DAOs for years now. And for those of you that may not be familiar, DAOs are one of the most popular organizational models within Web3. I like to compare it almost like to a cooperative. It's kind of this concept of collective decision making on where finances go within the org. So instead of a typical top-down structure, you're actually working with the other members of the DAO to decide where funds go, what you purchase, what you do as an org. And so when I met Nadia and I pitched the concept of what is now a unicorn DAO to her, you know, it became very obvious that Pussy Riot in a lot of ways functioned as a DAO. It was a collective community since the OG days of 2011, 2012, um, making decisions. And we could create kind of an evolution of that within Web3. Uh, so what that practically looked like is Unicorn DAO is a collecting group uh, that supports specifically women and queer creators in this space. 
Um, everything from helping launch projects of well-established creators to just purchasing and collecting pieces some, from some of the most well-known and recognized individuals in the space. And we launched this DAO back in March, I would say. And I even joked to my mom at the time that I was like, there's not an easier pitch to be giving out into the space right now because it's so obviously needed to have more structural organizations supporting these communities and groups. And so then, since then, we've really functioned as a collective. We've had DAO members going off and doing their own projects under the unicorn umbrella to support their woman and queer community wherever they may be based. And um, some of you may have been at uh, Nadia's talk last night with Judy Chicago, um, and they are kind of under the unicorn umbrella, bringing into the space what activism could look like. So it's been really kind of wonderful to watch it evolve and grow, and going into 2024, I'm sorry, going into 2023, we're not 2024 yet. Um, it, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how this evolves and the other community members that we can really bring into the DAO and the space. Um, I think it's really kind of beautiful, the ethos behind it. And there's also money to be made. You know, a lot of these female and queer creators are deeply undervalued, deeply, deeply undervalued because they just have not been recognized in the way we would hope thus far. And I'm very grateful to say that there has been significant movement in collectors purchasing a lot of the pieces that Unicorn Dow collected back in March now. You know, everything from pieces from Seneca to Claire Silver to Jen Stark. You know, there are just a lot of female-specific artists in this space that are not getting the attention they deserve. And I think in 10 years from now, we're really going to look back and collectors are going to realize they missed some really big wins because these women didn't necessarily have the platform at the time. Thank you so much. So um, now that with the time winding down, I'm going to give a question for the three of you to answer in the order in which we began. And uh, this question is based on something that Joe Lubin said to me at Miami a year ago when I asked him well, what he thought about what these OG, like the original NFT projects would be worth in the future, whether it's a punk, a squiggle, uh, an X shell, or uh, a Tyler Hobbs, or whatever it is, what these early projects that really sort of piqued everyone's interest and set off this trend. So the question to him was, what would they be worth in the future? And he answered, they'll always be historic and they'll always be the original pieces, the original things that set off the trend. So my question to you is, back to what our topic is, where will we be with these values in 10 years? Well, the short answer is we know that everything only goes up, so of course it'll all go up. Um, you know, who knows? I mean, I, 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 what has stayed here and what doesn't? I mean, I think, you know, there's art that's, there, there's so much, digital art has so many different meanings to different people. There's blockchain-based art, there's, you know, AI-generated art, there's, there's crypto, crypto art, crypto semi-art. So I think that what resonates with certain people or certain communities is going to change over time and that will determine, you know, what stays, what sticks around and what doesn't. And I also think that the whole concept of this of digital art and NFTs is evolving with the with the idea of utility. And and you know as brands get involved and, and sort of latch onto this, I think you know the concept of digital art maybe is changing a bit from you know how we at Christie's in any case think about it, which is more traditional fine art, and that's really the area that we're committed to, as opposed to the, the brand moment and the utility moment. You know, we don't necessarily care that uh, a piece has utility, we care that it, that it stands on its own for what it is, even if it's evolving over time. So I think it's just, I think, I think there's a lot of things that are gonna shake out here. I think what's important is that, starting with the people sale, I think digital art has been validated. And I don't think that's going to change. I think, you know, five, ten years ago, nobody really, it, it just didn't have the same um, gravitas that I think it has now. And I think that is here to stay and to grow, which is really exciting. Seth? Um, so I, I think in, in ten years, given even like the advances of AI in the last year, it's going to be really hard to tell what is actually made by an artist. 
especially when artists can now use like co-pilot AI systems to like come up with new code. And so I, I think to what Joe was saying, I think the, you know, the punks, the autoglyphs, the apes, um, the fidenzas, the meridians, the garden monoliths, like these are certain kinds of hieroglyphics in our life that tell stories that are stamped in time. And nothing will be able to take away from that. Like we, we know what was done when by which artist, and I think that's really powerful. And I think they're, they're, they, and they're we're in a world where there's so much inflation, economically and otherwise, there's only a thousand fidenzas. There's only 10,000 squiggles. It's something we can hold on to. If we have one, we feel part of a community. And I think that's valuable, and I think that will hold its value. I don't know where ETH or TEZ or any of these other chains are gonna be in 10 years, but I mean, I'm, I have the benefit of pattern recognition as an entrepreneur from Web 1, Web 2, and Web 3. And I really feel that there's a generation of artists working with code that in another era 20 years ago would have been the ones that started Uber and Airbnb and Google. Like just incredibly powerful thinkers who use code to tell stories. And instead of creating social media surveillance systems that we endlessly scroll, they're creating art. And I think that's really powerful. I'm super bullish on it. It's been a really trying 12 months with crypto crashes and 3AC and FTX and all these strange acronyms that are eroding trust in crypto. But if you think about um, self-custody, about decentralization, about um, being able to prove that this algorithm is only going to generate X many outputs on chain, um, those are powerful means and I think they'll stand the test of time. Yeah, something I would add to be a bit of a devil's advocate to what they're saying is there's a common phrase right now in the space that 99% of all NFTs will go to zero. And you know, what we mean by that is just there is a very high chance that a lot of collections thus far have been overvalued. And I think, you know, the projects we're naming are going to be historical in the long run and I think will continue to hold their value. But the vast majority, unfortunately, of projects are not going to make it five, ten years from now. They are definitely a piece of their time, in my personal opinion. But what I would add is that this ecosystem is still so new and as we grow and scale, more money will also come into this space as well as more artists, more leaders, etc. So I think for the projects that really are historical and with the founders of those projects that continue to spread the message of their art and bring in more buyers to their art, you will see the value continue to appreciate. But Adam, can I ask you, because I feel like the answer to that question in many ways depends on people like you. You know, when I walk through Basel today, there's almost nothing there in the way of real NFT or blockchain based art. But to the extent that the secondary market is interested in galleries like yours, you know, are featuring these works down the road at fairs like our Basel, you know, that will lend, you know, that is, that is a sort of contributing to or the measure of success in many ways for these pieces. So what's your view on that? I'm, Curious, do you? I know which time. And that's why I'm the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. My view is um, is uh, I don't know, but I, I think that um, what has been said and the, the community around these projects is the strength of it. And to the extent that the artists, the creators, the designers understand that they need to keep it alive and keep the community engaged, then they will have strength. And to the extent that the artist walks away from the project and abandons it, then the community will over time disintegrate. But what is clearly true about this collecting world, the digital collecting world versus the traditional collecting world is, this is a lot faster. The capital can just move much faster. So. You can have inflows and outflows of money that can happen in a day. Whereas in our market, 
would take a whole auction cycle of six months just to even make a step. And, you know, things will change in the art market over six months. Seeing in the crypto market, it could change over six minutes. Uh, and so that's very, very different. And whether or not this art will be accepted with that art, of course, it will all be different strokes for different folks. And um, I like to be the one who's exhibiting squiggles at the Nada Art Fair, but I also don't need to crash people into things that are not for them. It's like, this is for you if you'll listen to what this is about, and this other thing is for you if you'll listen to that. But uh, yeah, I think this movement is here to stay, but I agree with what Seth said. I mean, there's been so many ups and downs in this thing. When I was recently in, in Marfa um, for the Generative Art Weekend, it was amazing that that community is so strong. And it was just at the same time as FTX collapse, which is basically just a theft. Like that's just a plain old robbery. That's like a bank robbery. That's as old as the, you know, Bernie Madoff story and all the other stories. So it really has nothing to do with crypto and collecting. So I think that as long as the artists, creators, designers understand that it's about the community, then it will definitely continue. We have time for one question, if any of you would like to hit us with something. I have really a tough. question for you if you don't have if you don't have one in back there. Okay. I ask you a question. So ask okay. okay. <laughs> no, so in the in the in the bear market crash in June, I remember being in your office and you telling you showing me the Madonna people you bought. Talk to me about that purchase. Was that a good purchase? I'm asking. <laughs> I really don't know. I, I, I'm a contrarian, so if things are going down, I'm kind of looking for an opportunity. And uh, if everyone hates something, I want to know why, because I want to intellectualize that, understand that, analyze that. I felt as values were going down, people is you know, Mike Winkleman is one of the leaders of this field, and Madonna entering this world is such an unusual situation where Beeple's basically creating three uniques, and we saw what the value of Beeple could be, and this woman, who's like the most famous performer of her entire generation, putting herself in this situation, I thought was so interesting, and I heard someone come back and say, but it's a disaster, and it's bad, and it's it's, it's, she's crazy, and she's lost her way, and she's a tragic figure at this point. And I was like, well, think about Warhol. Marilyn was a tragic figure, Jackie was a tragic figure, and Liz was a tragic figure. I mean, the three women of Warhol are all tragedies. So, is this people's Liz? Is this people's Marilyn? That's the way I looked at it. Thank you, guys. Okay, we got one question here. Digital art? What's the place, what's the place of place? Well, Seth has been a pioneer in the digital, so you go for it. Um, I guess the question is about what's the place of digital art and our art, you know, sort of NFTs that come with prints or NFTs. In the galleries. Um, probably a longer answer, other, you know, I think to, I just, I know with generative art, there's a lot of interest now. For example, one of the shows we're thinking about for uh, the spring um, is a generative artist in Europe who um, uh, wants the output to be tapestries, right? So woven fabrics that will be the outputs of his generative art. Um, and so of course we support that. And of course we have to figure out um, how to time the show to allow the, the woven samples to be ready. Um, and at the same time, you know, the flip side of the devil's advocate here is, you know, there are some NFT funds that literally can't accept a physical object. So even if they buy an NFT that comes with a beautiful print or a sculpture, 
they can't take custody of it because it triggers some insurance issues with their LPs. So I think the answer is we have a long way to go. Um, There's a great piece in Basel right now by Simon, I think it's Simon Denny, a, a Berlin-based artist, that's, he's a blockchain, blockchain artist, so he, the blockchain is his medium, and he has a painting, like a traditional painting, of a plot in Decentraland. So he's painted what is, you know, the deed to the plot, is to, to the real estate, and then the NFT is an evolving um, version of that plot. So as different people, you know, buy pieces of the land, the NFT will change. So there's a physical and a digital, and they're not, it's not like one's just a printout of the other. They're actually two authentic pieces that stand on their own, but in conversation and really, you know, really focus on the issues of ownership and, um, and evolution and authenticity on the blockchain. So, I mean, that's a really interesting example, just from the very pure fine art perspective of how physical and digital can be relevant together and separately going forward. Well, thank you, panelists, and thank you, everyone. Thank you.